Oh, Sue, get off! It's... it looks like a list of questions that I have to ask you. Are you ready? Okay, Julian. How long have you been into horror films? Hmm. Uh, since I say bad. Nine, ten? Nine or ten? I'd say so. The old universal ones. Bella Lugosi, Dracula, Boris Karloff and Frankenstein. Not, not too scary, just enough to give you a couple of nightmares for a couple of weeks. Do you enjoy them still? Yes, yeah. Uh, I prefer a film that, that really does try and mess a bit with your brain and, uh, and put you into a nightmarish world or put you into the mind of a character who's a, who's a real sicko or something like that. Has there ever been a movie you found just too scary? Uh, well, when I was about eight, I found uh, Don Knotts in The Ghost and Mr Chicken absolutely uh, <laughs> a torment. Don Knotts has that effect on a lot of people, actually. I don't knock a great uh, comedian of our time like Don and Tim Conway, but no, at the, at the time, blood coming out of, uh, out of a piano and the piano playing itself seemed uh, worth, a, yes, a few nightmares and a few nights up with the lights. And... Yeah, I found, when I was really young, 13 ghosts really frightened me. I, I was frightened to go to bed for days afterwards. That's how I learned to lead a wild life, actually. I just stayed up with drugs. I was only seven at the time, but I don't want to talk about it. Let's not talk about me, let's talk about you. Why do you think uh, people go and see horror movies? Is it, is it that shared feeling of fear? People go to see a, a, com a comedy because they want the response of, they want the, the laughter drawn out of them, I, I suppose. In, a, in another way, another part of their brain's used and they, and they get some pleasure out of uh, out of the, the horror. I'm not, I'm not quite sure why, but, uh, but uh. Well, you know, I think you better have a good answer because there's just some nameless evil around here. God knows what could happen if you get this wrong, Julian. Don't want to threaten you, but I feel it here in my gut. I'll get to do a Tonight Show on Channel 10. I can just feel it. Hey, you've been there, done that, mate. It's hopeless, hopeless. <laughs> you think horror films encourage violence? No. No, um, my, my standard stock answer to this, and I believe it wholeheartedly, is if, if there's a guy that, that, or a girl or anyone that's that much on the edge that is, that is primed to uh, commit some sort of sociopathic act, if they, you know, if, if you can say a, a Rambo film caused such and such, well, if they didn't have access to that, they would have seen Shirley Temple in Seabiscuit and gone out and hit someone on the head with a horse, basically. Uh, it's, it's, you it's, haven't heard of the horrific animal crackers slaughters of 1932? <laughs> It's a frightening thought. Well, it says here, turn on the, turn on the TV set. Oh, hang on, it says, the remote control is to your right, you fool. Oh, Gina Lola Brigida. Well, turn on the set. It could be a clue. Agrophobia, fear of being beaten up. Angerophobia, fear of hairy goats. Dysphobia, fear of not being frightened. Ethnophobia, fear of subtitles. Hoprophobia, fear of coconuts. Dopiophobia, fear of getting high. Karmaphobia, fear of being reincarnated into the peasant class of a third world country. Fitzgerald has a great admiration for Peter Weir's use of Indonesian shadow puppets or Wayang in the year of living dangerously and this is reflected in the sinister silhouettes of H.G. and Roy here. Who are H.G. and Roy? Are they just another red herring or two red herrings or two black herrings in tomato sauce or a red herring and a trout or perhaps an important plot device? Gee, we've broken into Johnny Stone's house here and uh, this is a place of horrid and fearful omens, Roy. Yes, Let's start with Leon over here on this yep. one here. This is Johnny Stone's artwork. Well, Johnny here. Stone painted this in dedication or in memory of me, HG, in memory of some mornings when I wake up feeling, you know, a little bit strange, a little bit pickled, a little bit, uh, you know, over the moon or under the sun. You can see he's put a snake in my hand here and another snake around my head. 
it's obviously I feel like a bit of a dork, I feel like a, like a bit of a prawn, I feel like I'm a little bit out of it. And it shows how irrational fears can be, HG, because you can see, hey, I don't know if Leon can take this in, but all these people around here are laughing, they're happy, they're very much at home with themselves. I'm the odd man out, yet there's nothing really wrong with me. It's just that these are in my imagination, that's how irrational fears can be. But it's horrific. Roy, Sorry. if you woke up with a trouser snake in your hand and on your head, then well, you've got a lot of people, yeah, no, but a lot of people will be laughing at you too. Oh, so. yeah, I, I now, up this yeah. way, come, come up on. this way. Uh, now, Leon, here's a beautiful piece, and I hope Andrew can see this one at home, because I think this sums up what Andrew's life must be like. Yeah. Because quite often, Roy, yeah. I know he must wake up and feel as though somebody's got him by the cheeks and he's just pulling his head apart. Yeah, but he's doing it to himself, though, HG. This is what I find curious about this bit of Stoney's work. Now, come around this way, Leon, you'll see that it's actually the bloke himself. And he's so horrified by it. He's so scared of it, so he's full of fear there. Now, why is this, HG? Is this sort of a Victorian thing of the, the mask of how people really behave and the reality of how they really are? They're loud, they're courageous, but really they're, they're scared and fearful. Is this the way it works? Roy, the thing about this is you've seen both sides of the figure here. Yin and Yang. Yin and Yang, that's right. Andrew Denton and his alter ego, boy Andrew. Here, yeah. compressed into one artwork that Stoney's knocked up while listening to Dougie Milroy's uh, breakfast show. Oh, that morning. Yeah, you know, right. it's the sort of thing. Now, that's the sort made... of thing that expires, Roy. Sure. Now, now down here, here is what, uh, your, uh, Stoney did this for you? Stoney knocked this one up for me. I said, uh, Johnny, could you picture my life in about 50 years' time? Yeah. And what he did was said, um, you know, the iconography is easy to understand up there I originally was placed on a beautiful pedestal which somehow in the thunderstorms that's up there near the umbrellas and that. Got that mate. He's Has got he? a bit of bounce off. Oh, I got a bit of bounce off the floor there. Yeah. Uh, now down and of course it fell down here and somehow turned into a tunnel. Now you've spat the dummy out mate is this right? Slightly Roy. I'm still working on the Caulfield Melbourne Cup doubles there and I've got the transistor radio down there so I was going to listen to it but all these dames keep coming down the stairs and spewing over the side there and it's oh well it just stinks so I had to get a few onions in to you know kill the smell of their spew down pretty much right sure. but it's an agonising end isn't sure. it? You, there's not enough room in here mate to get the Gillette Super Blue in there it's, or the, and there's no mirror I imagine so you can't see yourself is this I right? gave it away Roy yeah. it was just taking up too much time yeah. when you go in and try stab uh, Caulfield Melbourne Cup yeah. doubles you need to focus on something well, certainly a fearful and horrific image, HG. I'd certainly give it that. Now, over here, come on, Leon, don't be scared. Here's a big one, Leon. Start Taking the big the picture, mate. Shot, Look at this. Stoney worked for weeks on this to yeah. get this right. Three he weeks had, he worked on this, mate. He, he had a lot of trouble with those musos, Roy. <laughs> they were hitting bum notes all the time. Yeah, he was going to paint them out. But I said, no, leave them in, son. Work at them, son. Don't give it up too soon. So what is it, Roy? Now, who did he put here, mate? What's this Charlton like? Heston's Charlton up there. Heston, Vivian Lee, yeah. and HG, this is you here, mate. That's right. That's that? my fearful thing. I said to him, Stoney, I'm always the monkey. Yeah. I'm always the ape in the show. And I, it, and this is it, mate. The artist me. often sees him or herself as the odd man out, puts themselves in, portraying an extremely broad canvas of fear, of loathing, of everything horrific. And, uh, gee, I don't think the imagination could ever picture it as clearly as that. Andrew, what a week. It's been incredible, Andrew, and uh, gee, good luck to your son. If you've survived this, you're doing incredibly well. Yeah, I haven't. And then, just as the film seems lost and confused in its own B-grade, stabby, stabby, screamy, knifey, knifey, gouge, gore, irky, perky horror genre, along comes a quite remarkably powerful scene acted with a certain flair and pancake. I'm sorry, roll that again. I'm sorry, panache. Smoke? No thanks. No. Neither do I. <sighs> it's funny, I, I've never really talked to you, Warren. I, all this time I've been host of the show, you've been floor sweeper, and I've never got to know you. That's showbiz. Showbiz is dead, Warren. You've got to accept that. I, I know that. <sighs> do, you, do you think we'll get out of this alive? We've got to. Imagine not knowing who's won the Burt Newton School of Stardom. Entries for which close on October the 14th. And there's been so many fabulous entries. Yeah. Yeah. Dear Sir, Madam, I wish to host the final blah, blah, blah as I work in a bank. Yours most sincerely, David Stevens, Chester Hill, New South Wales. I am a John Lennon and Jesus Christ look-alike, able to make my hair stand on end, off my face and unafraid to play the fool. Brad Nelson, Auburn, New South Wales. Give me the job, you bastards. Love, Rebecca Lupton, Lismore, New South Wales. I want to be paid millions of dollars to do the Brescia commercials. I want to be exploited by impressionable young girls. I want to be able to get things for free. I want a BMW. And the perfect remedy is Andrew Denton's job. From Mr Valerius Calaturinos.
Sylvania Waters, New South Wales. You know, Warren, it really eats of my guts that we've seen this competition through so far, and yet we may never know how it ends. We can kill this thing. We can do it. Just be careful. Well, for me, the crowd scenes in Blower 3 are a major disappointment. The amateur acting, the shoddy camera work, the absolute lack of detailing in makeup and costume are just not what we expect of a major Australian release. And yet, they do admittedly have a certain charm. Well, are you into watching horror films? Yeah, sometimes. What do you get out of them? Um, a laugh half of the time. And other times, I suppose, a bit of a scare. What do you like about being scared? Um, I like the trip to the lavatory afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a different sort of a thrill, isn't it? It's a different sort of a kick. You have your, your kicks during the day, you, you know, you open up a Playboy and get a kick and you go and see a horror film and you get a different sort of kick. Do you get a buzz out of it? Oh, I don't know. It's sort of a, um, a letting off steam sort of buzz, I suppose. You have a bit of a laugh after you've been scared and you realise how stupid you are for being scared. Right, what about you? Do you get a buzz out of horror films? Definitely, yep. Why so? It gets the adrenaline going. I like fear and I like it in a controlled environment. So I know nothing's really going to happen. It's a good way to experience sensations that if you experienced outside the cinema would be a dangerous or life-threatening setup. Do you think they encourage violence? No, I think the violence, you know, it's quite surreal that um, horror films these days are a collection of uh, special effects, so it's not a urban violence that you could ape and take out into the streets. OK. What about you? Do you think horror films encourage violence? I think they can, in an immature mind, possibly, like with children, but not in a mature adult mind. It depends on the individual person, but I think the potential is certainly there. So are you into watching horror films? Not at all. I hate them. Do you put yourself into scary situations? Um, no, not really. <laughs> I'd try not to. Why not? Um, because I just, I don't like being scared, really. I think it's a horrible feeling. I don't think it's fun at all. OK, what about you? Do you like putting, do you get a buzz out of putting yourself into dangerous situations? Oh, occasionally, I suppose, but I don't know. I did once, and when I was horse riding troop, and I'll never do it again. Three days of horse riding, and I thought it'd be fun, and it was just so scary. I thought, no way. <laughs> It wasn't a buzz, Sophia. Oh, it was a buzz, but it was so scary. I mean, you got off and you thought, no way, I just paid all this money to kill myself and this and that, but I don't know. Russell here is into skydiving, which I think is pretty scary for most people. Why? Um, I think it's probably a venture sport, and it's just pushing yourself to the edge of your fear factor. And it's much better than roller coasters and stuff like that. You actually get a much bigger adrenaline rush. Is that why you do it? Um, I suppose so. I just enjoy doing it. It's why I started, but not why I do it now. Why do you do it now? The pleasure. Any fear? Uh, I think there's always a little bit of fear, but it's controlled, so it's not scary anymore. You skydive too. Is that a buzz for you? Oh, most definitely. What effect does it have on your body? Oh, it raises the heartbeat, um, puts a smile on your face, makes your hands tremble. Oh, good fun. <laughs> Do you think it's addictive? Most definitely. Yeah, you've know, got to get your weekly adrenaline buzz. What about you? Do you put yourself into uh, dangerous situations? Oh, yes, yeah, going to work every day. <laughs> Catching the bus down the freeway. Crossing the road in the morning on the way to school can be a killer. You know, you just you think you've made it and then suddenly there's this toot from behind. But, you know, but I don't really enjoy it, no. I think I'm going to die often. And then, just as we're getting settled into the plot, a film reviewer appeared and for no apparent reason started reviewing the film. And then, just as we're getting settled into the plot, a film reviewer appeared and for no apparent reason started reviewing the film. I'm at the second junction. I'm right here. I've got a reading on you. 
It, it looks like it's, it's at the third junction. You're going to have to be careful. I've, I've reached the third junction. I'm going down. Now hold your position. I've lost the signal. What? You sure? Well, look around. Are you sure it's not there? Check your gear. It could be the interference. Are you sure you can't see anything? It's got to be there somewhere. Warren! I'm going to get the hell out of here. Oh, my God, it's coming out to you! Move! Get out of there! Move! Warren. Oh, God. Who are you? I'm Robin Vines. I'm head of the Student Health and Welfare Unit at Swinburne Institute of Technology and College of TAFE. I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm here to talk to you about fear. What do you want me to do? I think you have to ask me these questions. <laughs> What sort of things scared you when you were a child? Why? Oh, it's two questions, sorry. What sort of things scared you when you were a child? Spiders, nightmares, wolves, shadows on the wall and snakes under the bed. In any particular order or all at once? Probably the latter first. <laughs> I'm sure Freud would have had something to say about that. No, he was too scared. <laughs> Do those uh, sort of things still scare you today? No, not snakes under the bed anymore. What about Freud? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I had him under my bed once, but I don't want to talk about it. I'm, I'm actually really uh, frightened of spiders too. That's probably my great fear. Aside from another one, the Vaseline, but I don't want to talk about that either. We won't talk about that. No, yeah. I mean, where, where would a fear like that have come from, do you think? Which, the Vaseline? No, no, no spiders. The spiders. <laughs> Uh, I think it's partially instinctual. I think most people have a fear of spiders, but I also think that uh, fear of spiders is, is partially learned. Um, so that kids, if, if they see their parents being scared of spiders, uh, they pick that up. Or, you know, if they've had a bad experience with spiders, then that's a learnt phobia as a result of that. So it's a combination yeah. of the two, really. I don't know. I've... I know our pet bird spider attacked me when I was young, but nothing particularly <laughs> serious happened. What about, um, are most fears like that? Are they learned or are they are some purely instinctual? I think we have some instinctual fears. For example, um, there are some, there, there's some research to suggest that we're, we're scared of heights. They've um, done glass cliffs with, with babies and babies will not crawl out over glass if they see that there's a drop. So it seems to be an instinctual avoidance of that. Um, I think that there are some instinctual fears of, of snakes and spiders, uh, but I think most of our fears are learnt through bad experiences in the past. For example, someone who's scared of birds has usually had an experience of, of a bird sort of attacking them. I know, I've seen someone who's very scared of birds was, was uh, referred because she had to drive to work across Trafalgar Square every morning and couldn't tolerate that and she was attacked by a swan when she was younger and developed a phobia about birds as a result of that. Knowing her like she'll become Mr Hawke's private secretary. <laughs> Never be able to turn up to work. <laughs> is, uh, is fear a survival instinct? Indeed it is. I mean I think we, we all need fear. It's a way of alerting us to a threatening or potentially harmful situation. Uh, we have a fight-flight response so that if we're to be attacked by something we can either flee or attack in response and a fear it's gone it's all right <laughs> i'm here <laughs> i'm most comforted in the fear response really is basically adrenaline pumping around your system um, we were talking about this before with the horror movies i mean people can get addicted to this adrenaline because it's the same physiological basis for fear or excitement and i think that what happens is that in horror films that physiological response is precipitated by frightening stimuli, but it gives you a sensation of excitement because you know you're safe. Um, but really what happens with frightening or threatening situations is that there's a tremendous surge of adrenaline in your body which prepares you to either fight or flee that, that difficult situation. I know where you can get some good adrenaline cheap. I'm sure you do. Speak to you, huh? <laughs> you deal 
a lot with agoraphobia, don't you? Which is generally thought to be a fear of wide open spaces. Yes, that's the traditional understanding of agoraphobia. But in fact, it's come to mean much more than that. It's really the fear of any situation in which the person thinks they're going to be overwhelmed by panic. Now, that may be on a train or a tram or in a lift. It's very similar. I mean, it's the same thing as claustrophobia. So it's much broader than that traditional definition of agoraphobia is the fear of open spaces. So it's almost a fear of fear? Indeed it is. It's the fear of being overwhelmed by physiological responses caused by the adrenaline pumping around your system, which you don't know is fear, and so you're very frightened about what's happening in your own body. At this point, unexpectedly, the interview is interrupted. Well, how do people reach such a state? What usually seems to happen is that people have a period of cumulative tension in their lives and it, it, it's for many different reasons. Um, agoraphobia occurs, or the onset of agoraphobia occurs after, say, the death of someone in your family and you, th there's unresolved mourning and as a result of that build-up of feelings, some women develop it after the birth of a baby, which is a huge lifestyle shock. Some people develop it after exam worries or being dropped by a boyfriend, relationship ending, things like that a build-up of tension and then there's a final straw that breaks the camel's back and tips a person over into something that's more than anxiety. It's a fully blown panic attack which is just adrenaline pumping around your system, giving you palpitations which is your heart beating like nobody's business, hyperventilation, difficulty getting your breath, shaky muscles, sweatiness, hot and cold flushes, all these sorts of feelings and once you've had I that... that was sex. <laughs> In fact, it's very similar, but it's your perception of the situation that's, that's the problem. If people are very frightened of those feelings, they wonder what's happening to them. They think with the palpitations, for example, that they're going to have a heart attack, they're going to die or that they're going to faint, or in fact that they're going mad, something like this. And because they're frightened of the feelings, they then try to avoid the situations where they think they might get the feelings. So they start to avoid trains, trams, any situation, and the problem is the avoidance then overta overtakes their lives. Is that very common? Agoraphobia is indeed very common. Approximately one in 30, it's very difficult to estimate, but one in 30 people have some degree of it. Um, uh, and about one in a thousand become totally housebound as a result of these fears. Why can't the agoraphobics of the world come out? This, because, this is the question we must ask. Indeed, and the reason is that they're so frightened of the feelings that they don't know how to deal with them and they just avoid them. And the problem is the avoidance makes the fears worse because if you're not tackling the situation, you never prove to yourself that you can cope with it. So they don't come out because they're frightened of the feelings, they don't understand what's happening to them. It is possible to get over it. Um, that's why I've written the book called Agoraphobia, The Fear of Panic, to help people understand what's happening to them and learn how to cope with it and overcome their avoidance and build up their confidence again. So Robin, do you find that fear is... Robin? Robin! Hi, swingers. Speaking of fear and horror, I'm Bob Dowd. Every time you kiss me, I'm still not certain that you love me. Every time you hold me, I'm still not certain that you care. Oh, you keep on saying you really, really, really love me. Do you speak the same words to someone else when I'm not there? Suspicion torments my heart. Suspicion keeps us apart. Suspicion, why don't you me? Every time you call me and tell me we should meet tomorrow. I can't help but think that you're meeting someone else tonight. Why should our romance just keep on causing me such a sorrow? 
Why am I so doubtful whenever you are out of sight? Suspicion torments my heart. Suspicion keeps us apart. Suspicion, why don't you me? Darling, if you love me, I beg you, wait a little longer. Yes, you. Wait until I drive all these foolish fears out of my mind. Uh, how I hope and pray that our love will keep on growing stronger. Love the show. And I hope you're going to come and see me at the last laugh from November the 11th in Bob and Carly's. Pick a hit. You promise? You promise? Suspicion torments my heart. Suspicion keeps us apart. Suspicion, why torture me? It is estimated that 30% of people will experience at least one irrational panic attack in their lives, and up to 5% of this group will go on to develop severe emotional disorders or phobias. Agoraphobia is the most common and intractable of all fears and phobias. About 100,000 Australians are defined as agoraphobics, while another 300,000 experience recurring panic attacks. More than 70% of agoraphobics are women. One thing I really must commend is Fitzgerald's bravery in running the closing credits at what appears to be a completely inappropriate time. Uh, not yet, though. Let me finish. To me, it does smack of a certain devilry, but it just might work. The tram scene in Blur is quite pivotal to the action and yet it is strongly reminiscent of a streetcar named Desire. Andy Neal's portrayal of Stanley Kowalski is equaled only by David Soul's Rick in the remake of Casablanca. <laughs> What's the scariest situation you've ever been in? It's difficult to remember. I think probably being chased by wild monkeys in Indonesia. Terrifying. Oh, when I was little, a uh, rat broke into um, my room when it was about 12 o'clock at night and I woke up in the morning and there was a rat sitting on my pillow. It'd have to be when Paul and I went to a small cemetery in Northcote in the middle of the night and it's a really old cemetery and it, that was just really scary. I could picture skeletons jumping out of the graves. When I was about seven I got locked in the McDonald's toilet and I couldn't get out and I had to kick the door just about down to get any attention for somebody to come and get me out. What kind of things scared you as a child? My father's belt. The dark, and I used to get really scared when I took the plug out of the bath and I thought I was going to get sucked down the drain. Being by myself or in the dark or something. It took me until I was about eight years old to sleep with the light off and then another few years before I could sleep with the door shut. Once I remember waking up in the middle of the night and ran, ran into mum and dad crying because I thought they were going to die and leave me by myself. <laughs> 
great big German shepherds that bound towards you and jump on you. Spiders, mainly spiders. <laughs> what sort of things are you scared of now? Uh, let's see, spiders. Is there anything you're scared of in your life now? Uh, fatherhood and responsibility, I guess. Walking by myself in the dark. Going to hell. Rejection. Going out into the real world, finding a job. Failure. Crashing my car with all my friends in it, and I survived and they all died, just couldn't handle that. Silence. Driving. Being lost. Nuclear disaster. Being attacked. Okay, still. Oh, you wouldn't believe the time I've had. And I've heard the weirdest thing if I call out Jean Kitson. Jean Kitson. Jean Kitson. She speaks. What kind of things are you scared of? Well, my most recent one is aggressive teenagers of Collingwood. But my general one is going blind or losing my fingers. Why are you scared of aggressive teenagers from Collingwood? Um. Well, I try to avoid them, but they seem to, um, find me. What do they do when they find you? They want to bash, bash me, basically. For, for no reason. They know. <laughs> Why are you scared of being bashed? Because it hurts. It hurts my, <laughs> hurts my nose. <coughs> are you scared of dying? If they bashed me enough, yeah. Are you scared of things you don't know about? Yeah, basically things like the greenhouse effect and if uh, the Liberal Party won the Victorian government election last week, which hopefully, you know, I'm not that scared about anymore until the next four years come up and perhaps Jeff Kennett's still in power. That's pretty scary. Are you scared of things that aren't a physical threat like Jeff Kennett? <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm scared of um, sort of posters falling off the wall at night, the sort of sound of blue tech sort of squelching <laughs> off the wall. That's unknown, but when it becomes physical and lands on your face, then it's not so scary. But it's just the sort of sound of the, you know, unknown that's happening. Yeah, that's pretty scary. Um, yeah, I've got personal fears. <laughs> like what? Um, I'm scared of my mum. <laughs> uh, I'm a bit scared of the dark. And um, I'm scared of getting beaten up when I walk down the street because I walk around in the dark a lot on my own. So I'm scared of that. Have you got any fears that aren't life-threatening fears, that aren't physical fears? Um, dentists. <laughs> it's a physical fear though. Someone right inside your mouth. Just someone... <laughs> <laughs> You might choke. I mean, it's really terrifying. I've got an appointment next week. Um, and general anaesthetics. When they give you the last injection, and the cold comes up your arm, and you think, no, I'm, no, 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 I'm not going to have it today. I'll have it tomorrow. And you don't know what happens. You've got no control of your body. What about you? Have you ever been scared about talking to someone? Uh, yeah, uh, I've got a, a phobia, Andrew Denton phobia, actually, and I'm um, here tonight on uh, the um, advice of my doctor, and apparently my only cure is to confront my fear and uh, and actually touch my fear. And that's the... You're not touching me, mate. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, well, actually, uh, fear of mum, yeah, that's a pretty severe fear. You're scared of your mum? Uh, not now. Uh, I don't think so, anyway, maybe subconsciously, but uh, um, when you're a child, uh, she's a great force in your life, and my mum was a great force. Um, you know, she's particularly uh, heavy-handed, not physically, but emotionally. Yeah. Have you ever been scared about getting into trouble? Uh, yes, I have. <laughs> Why is that? Um, I guess because um, the person... Well, well, can I start this again? <laughs> sure, go for it. Um, yeah, I have been... Um, scared of being getting into trouble just for I just can't do this I think I'm scared of doing this <laughs> okay what about you you've been never been scared of getting into trouble uh, always yeah yeah I don't know it's a conditioned reflex I suppose um, like the fear you have when a, a cop comes towards you even though you know you haven't done anything wrong you still you know <laughs> still have hot flushes you know thanks Andy Robin do the sort of social fears such as uh, being rejected or, or failing 
Uh, do they have the same effect on your body, such as common physical fears, such as being attacked by Collingwood teenagers? <laughs> Yes, I think the physiological basis of it is the same. I mean, if you're anxious with other people, you have the same adrenaline pumping around, around your body. I think what is different with some of the fears that have been talked about is that it's not the feelings themselves that are frightening, but it's the actual situation out there of rejection by the other person or being attacked by teenagers and so on. That's the problem. Some social phobias are related to the fear of the feelings themselves. For example, some people are scared of confronting a situation like this when they're on camera because they think that if they're overwhelmed by panic, they're gonna make a fool of themselves because they'll do something bizarre. The panic will make them sort of go mad, you know? And that's, that's the fear. <laughs> it's an example. <laughs> it's all right now. Does confidence have much to do with fear? Indeed it does. I think that if you are confident, you are courageous and not fearful. I mean, I think that obviously even confident people have their own anxieties and fears. It's a normal part of, <laughs> it's a normal part of being human. But uh, if you are a confident person and have good self-esteem, then you're going to be less riddled by fears than those who have low self-esteem. Jean, are you there? Come in, Jean. Yes, I'm here, Andrew. Thank you. Um, can fears affect other aspects of your life, do you think? Yeah, I think so. Fear can affect confidence, which is the main thing. To be able to overcome a fear and confront it can make you much more confident and acceptable and to other people and other fears. Well, have you overcome any fears? No. Why not? Because I think, I think fear grows on you. I think as you get older, you think, oh, shit. <laughs> Um, like, if you want to, uh, when you're younger, you tend to do things without thinking, but as you get older, with more responsibilities, you uh, uh, tend to think, well, uh, should I do this? Am, uh, uh, am I at risk or am I putting someone else at risk? Well, from personal experience, I've just been through a series of job interviews, so I know it's pretty scary to start off with, but you, you get more comfortable with, with time. That's the same with all fears, I guess. Robin, what's the best way for people to cope with their fear? Well, I think we've just heard some of the ways that Tackling and practicing um, facing those situations is the only way of overcoming fear. But there are certain things that can help in that. First of all, it's important to try and counteract the physiological feelings of anxiety. And you can do this by learning to relax. And there are lots of relaxation training methods around. Um, it's also important to counteract the thoughts about the fear so that you know you're not going to lose control. But it's also important just to tackle and practice the behaviour, uh, such as um, an interview situation, or if you are fully agoraphobic, tackling the situations like going on a train and tram and so on. It boils down in the end to courage, I suppose. Indeed it does, to facing the things you've been avoiding and fearing and trying to practice being in those situations. Well, how would you recommend I overcome my fear of spiders? Well, I'd recommend, first of all, that you got a book about spiders and started to relax. I have hundreds whilst, of books about spiders. Whilst, tried to relax whilst looking at the spiders and then gradually approaching uh, the real situation gradually uh, with plastic spiders, spiders in bottles, learning to relax as you do this. As the person in the audience was saying over there, um, it's a case of desensitising yourself, very gradually facing the real situation and learning to counteract the feelings of fear. And this is what I've tried to emphasise in my book, The Fear of Panic, so that people can learn techniques to counteract that anxiety. No fear of merchandising, I know. <laughs> That's absolutely true, but I also think that it's important that people do know that they can help their fears if they have them severely. It's a problem that a lot of people have, and it's important for them not to think that they're going bananas with it, that there is help available. <coughs>
a holiday, almost anything, you can get a personal loan for it. But, as our money man Michael vaguely warns, there are loans and there are loans.